today, we're happy to host Dr. Jennifer Thayer presenting All Speaking is Public Speaking. At the conclusion of this lecture, we'll be happy to answer some questions that you may have. Um, please utilize the question, the Q&A section down at the lower portion of your page for questions. Um, you, you're more than welcome to post those questions throughout the uh, speaking. However, we will be allocating time, roughly 15 minutes, for the end of the presentation to answer those questions. Any questions that we do not get to, please feel free to post those questions as well too, and we'll send some contact information that you can reach out to us and we will be more than happy to answer those questions. Without any further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Beheshti. Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second event of the Industry Leaders Talk Series hosted by the New York Institute of Technology's College of Engineering and Computing Sciences. My name is Babak Beheshti, uh, Dean of the College. This series is co-hosted uh, by our college as well as the IEEE Region 1. My thanks go to uh, Mr. Ed Palacio, the IEEE Region 1 Director. Our audience today is composed of uh, IEEE professionals and students uh, from across the Northeastern United States, as well as the College of Engineering's student, current students, alumni, and a number of distinguished guests. I would like to thank the College of Engineering's Dean's Executive Advisory Board, particularly its chair, Dr. Robert DeFazio, who has been instrumental in organizing uh, this series. We have four more talks scheduled as <clears throat> part of the uh, uh, series this is spring. We would love to have the same audience participate uh, in the remaining talks uh, in the series as well. Moreover, we hope that this series becomes another recurring signature event for the college. Uh, please note that this lecture will be recorded and the recording link will be made available to you uh, in a follow-up communication. Today's industry leader in the series is uh, Dr. Jennifer Thayer uh, of Mott's Point Consulting. Uh, please review Jennifer's bio sketch available on the event website. Jennifer is also a member of the College of Engineering's Dean's Executive Advisory Board. Without any further ado, I'll pass it on to Jennifer for her talk. Jennifer? Thank you, Babek, and thank you to all of you who made this happen today. Let's face it, my friends, no one really wants to eat kale salad. Kale is a superfood, we all know that. We all know we should eat more of it, and we don't, because each one of us has an excuse. Ugh, it's so hard to prepare. You know, I don't like the texture. It's just boring. I had it once at Aunt Margaret's house, and I, it, it was awful, it was awful. It doesn't matter if our favorite athlete eats four pounds a day. It doesn't matter if the woman who died last week at 106 with all her teeth intact and subsisted on kale salad for 40 years. You can't make me. Hi, I'm Jennifer Thayer. I'm the founder and CEO of The Board Mechanic. I help not-for-profits and companies design governance and good intentional board of directors. I also conduct custom board assessments. Basically, I help organizations become more sustainable and to thrive with good governance. I sell kale for a living. It's Baltimore, it's March, and I'm giving a presentation to the CEO and executive leadership team of a biotech company, publicly traded, mind you. I have fabulous slides that are replete with industry benchmarks. Um, every uh, raw data, piece of raw data you can imagine, and I have laid out an entire board agenda and plan for the coming year. I have all the answers. The CEO, a newly installed Young Turk who is clearly impatient with my detailed reporting, suddenly eyes me with the intensity of a cobra about ready to strike and he hisses, so what makes a board director good? I freeze. I can feel the sweat on my hands begin to prickle. My throat goes inexplicably dry. I think for a hot sec and I mumble, mumble something 
incoherent. I am mortified because he has asked me something so basic, something so fundamental to what I do, and I can't answer it. Once out of that boardroom, I scour the literature looking for some kind of an answer to this question. Why hasn't anybody talked about this? I don't find the answer. And the question haunts me for, for years. So about two years later, I'm at a small governance conference down in Florida and an investment banker comes up with probably the simplest and most clear eyed answer to that CEO's question. It's courage. Why is courage important to good board governance? Because it takes a courageous director to hold everybody in that boardroom until management delivers a comprehensive and coherent plan about how to keep employees safe and financially secure during a raging pandemic. Because it takes a courageous director to insist that her colleagues vote out a CEO whose blind eye to sexual predations in the executive ranks has left the workforce demoralized and put the company on the brink of failure. Because it takes a courageous, CEO, it takes a courageous director to insist that management adhere to a very aggressive target for diversity and gender hiring in the executive ranks and then pegs executive compensation to meeting those targets. Courage is not an innate characteristic that some people have and some people don't. It's not dumb, it's not something you can test for but rather it thrives in an environment where there is intentional um, board development, good governance practices, and a solid governance framework in which everybody can operate with an eye to what is best for the company. So um, if this is of interest to you, if you've got that kind of commitment, then call me. Write me at jennifer at theboardmechanic.com or visit my website to set up an appointment on my calendar because together we can put in place the things that will help your company thrive, be sustainable, and ultimately make more money. Thank you. So that, my friends, is a short piece I wrote to introduce people to my work. I offer it as an example around which to organize my talk today. And the talk will progress as follows. There are three parts. So part one, I'll give you my opinion about the role of story in connecting to your audience and helping them to understand, support, and remember your ideas. Part two, we'll talk about worry. I'll hit the topic of performance anxiety and how you can cope with it. And in part three, We'll do mechanics. We'll close with ways to make your presentation user-friendly with tips about your presence, your voice, and how you um, organize your presentation. So let's go. Public speaking is the art of saying anything out loud. And so my talk will focus more on formal presentations of some sort before a live audience or on Zoom, usually with the goal of selling an idea or your business or a startup concept or perhaps presenting some information in a class. I hope that you will put much of what I um, say today into the broader context where any speaking is public speaking and you begin to incorporate ways to present yourself, ways to use your voice, ways to use your hands to provide more impact than you might otherwise be conscious of making. Um, while I've geared my talk more towards students, I do see that there are members from IEEE here, and so I hope you'll also be able to take away something. So um, I really uh, got captivated by the idea of using more stories to illustrate my ideas after doing a couple of public speaking boot camps. Um, and, and my evidence for the impact of stories comes from my kids. Who can recite chapter and verse stories I've told them 15 years ago 
and yet they cannot remember the detailed instructions I gave them last week for what to do in the event of a car accident. So looking back at my short pitch, it has a structure that I think will also work for a longer piece, where you open up with something attention grabbing. Um, some of the research I've seen is um, asserts that you have seven seconds to get somebody's attention um, when you're giving a presentation. And so that says that that first line has to be impactful, your voice has to be strong. So open up with something attention grabbing. It could be a piece of data, it could be a few lines from uh, our news story that has a lot of people talking, or it could be in this case, something that seems like a total non sequitur. You could open with a joke only if you feel confident that you have multi-generational, multicultural, and multi-general, multi-gender family-focused group feedback that your joke is gonna work. And I will say, as someone who was an inveterate joke teller, I actually developed a reputation at my first summer job for the go-to person for the daily, the daily joke. Um, most people never remembered them. People will tell you all day long, I can't remember jokes. They can remember your stories. And it's part because stories create, they create images, they create narrative, and oftentimes you're involved. So it's a lot more personal. So getting back to that opener where um, you want it short, you're gonna circle back to it later in the presentation. It's, you've gotta make that opener make sense in the context of your talk or presentation. You also want something that, frankly, is going to make enough people stop looking at their phone or elsewhere on their computer screen. One aspect and advantage of the short piece is that while you might not recall my story or any of the governance advocacy points I made, you're going to remember me as the kale girl, for better or for worse. I think that's fine because I, myself, eat a lot of kale. And I am actually willing to share with you the kale recipe that started me on my kale habit. Lastly, I honestly believe that good governance is the kale of business administration. So now if I were doing a long form presentation about corporate governance, I would likely start with the story about the CEO in Baltimore in March. And um, from there, I would be able to develop. Now, as I started to say, the incorporation of storytelling into my public speaking is a very recent change as to how I present. My people are a deeply private lot. I was born and bred to say as little about myself as possible. I'm also violently insecure, so much so that when I have to present on a topic in which I have some fluency, my talk will incorporate big words, statistics, rhetorical flourish, because I need you to believe that I'm an expert, and I do that by using big words and language. Having started to develop an interest in the storytelling piece, I'm now more interested in showing you how my work has influenced me and in creating a connection between our shared experience where you might then find my work more relevant to what you do. Because ultimately, you'll do business with me because you trust me, because you believe I'm authentic, and because I've made a memorable, memorable connection with you. Not because I can recite the entire corporate governance handbook upside down and sideways. So last year, excuse me, I caught the tail end of a conversation on WNYC in which a grassroots community organizer was talking about her efforts to combat misinformation around the COVID-19 vaccine. And in the interview, the organizer shared her opinion that the science community is doing a terrible job of promoting the vaccine. She concluded with this line, sure, we have all the data, we come at them with all the data, but they have the stories. And I think we've seen a lot in our politics over the past year, especially where people have been captivated by stories over the data. 
if that doesn't reinforce for you the power of stories, um, then I don't have I don't have anything else to tell you. Um, so let's go back. Let's go back to the mechanics of constructing your story. As you construct that opening story, follow a simple narrative trajectory. You're going to start with the initiating action, and in my case, that was the presentation to the CEO and the board. And you'll build the narrative arc with some details around the where and the what, the who. As you build those details, bring me into the room with you. Create details that speak to the five senses so that I can feel them with you. You know, I had the sweat pricking my palms. Many of us have had that experience, the dry throat, the panic, the paralysis. And then we're building up to that crescendo, the top of the apex, the apex where the CEO asks his question, for which I have no answer. And then, on the, then, then the story starts to sort of wind down where I'm looking for the information. About halfway down, we then peek out into me finding the answer and being able to riff off of that. That's the resolution. Then you'll connect that back to your work. In my case, why courage is important. In the process of creating and telling your story, you'll create a stronger connection to the audience with your personal history. And then from that same, same theme, you can develop the rest of the presentation. While mine ended quickly, I could also have used that narrative as a lead in for a case study on director selection or a commentary on the lack of courage on corporate boards in America, or I could have used it to set up a, um, a training on director diversity that uses courage as a theme. I will share that something strange happens when you expend time developing your story around your work. I came to understand my own why, why I was in this, why I had landed here. I did find the process painful and fitful. Um, I don't like to talk about myself. I also don't like to talk about situations where I failed. But the payoff has been very rich for me because it's helped me to understand my attraction to my work, but also better to explain it to people who might be wanting to know more about what I do or want to work with me. They'll walk away with memorable quotations and images from the story I tell them. My work tends to be arcane, somewhat arcane. I mean, you're engineers, you're, you probably also share this, and also features in a somewhat obscure value proposition. Um, corporate governance is not unlike better nutrition. So I do fully recognize that some of us talking about ourselves is hard and can bring up, you know, can trigger some feelings of worry or anxiety. And that's where we go to the second part. Next slide, please, Sarah. And this is on anxiety. We need to talk about anxiety. A full 75% of people say that public speaking makes them anxious. And I would hazard the other 25% are lying. Sunday morning, I'm on YouTube trying to find SNL's cold open from the night before, that Fauci game show in which he's trying to figure out who's gonna get the next vaccine. The algorithm, while I'm looking for it, pops up a video suggestion from a personal coach whose work I'm familiar with and, and actually I admire. And the video, oddly, is about anxiety. So I was not planning to hit this topic as hard as I'm gonna hit it right now, but when I saw this video and when I started to use this technique for myself in not, not just playing around and preparing for this presentation, but in a couple of other places in my life where I'm feeling a little, little anxiety, um, I thought it was great. I thought it was brilliant even. So props to Mel Robbins, M-E-L, R-O-B-B-I-N-S, and this following block derives from her research. Mel has ADHD and she has struggled lifelong with anxiety and panic. So in order to kind of take back her life from these conditions, 
Mel's done a deep dive into the neuroscience of both her ultra active mind and her anxiety and her panic. She shares that researchers have found notable physiological similarities in the body between fear and excitement. Now for us trying to be more grounded public speakers, this suggests we might be able to trick our brain. Mel pioneered, so, so I'm gonna take us through this, um, this technique of hers. Mel pioneered the five second rule, which she uses to interrupt her brain's habituated autopilot thought patterns. Um, using the five second rule will allow you to take over the neurological steering of your brain and turn it towards a thought and action that you control. So for our purposes here, when our internal dialogue starts to go negative on giving a talk or a presentation that's like, you know, what does your brain say? Oh, why did I agree to do this? Oh, I, this is, I can't, oh, I can't even, this is making me anxious, I can't do this, I don't wanna do this. Use Mel's five second rule. Hear those um, thought patterns in your brain and now you're gonna count backwards. Five, four, three, two, one. You could do it out loud or you could do it to yourself. This interrupts that negative dialogue. And then you can use the resulting space to introduce what you want the brain to think. That's your anchor thought. Your anchor thought will portray a positive thought, feeling, or image of the event that is making you anxious. In our case, it's the presentation we need to make or, the, or the, maybe even a hard conversation we need to have. The anchor thought should be contextual it will reflect whatever would be a pleasant outcome for you, one that makes sense in the, context, in the context of the situation. So I'm a helper personality. My anchor thought is naturally about feedback that I helped somebody in the audience. So my anchor thought for giving this presentation was that afterwards, I would get a message from someone in the audience saying, wow, what you said, blah, 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 really helped me, thank you so much. Your anchor thought might be receiving an invitation to speak again, or that you got a great new client out of the presentation, or you got a great grade if you're giving it in front of a class, or you're hearing a compliment from a colleague. Your anchor thought is a control point in that it acts to keep your brain from escalating the negative dialogue which perhaps for some of us can initiate a really uncomfortable physiological response, such as mental paralysis, um, uh, um, heart palpitations, sweating, general anxiety. And so remember when I opened up talking about the similarities between fear and anxiety, of uh, fear and excitement, using the five second rule to interrupt anxiety, and then the anger thought is your control point, your brain then starts to think, oh, oh wow, Jennifer's really excited about giving this talk. You're reframing the emotional context for your brain, moving it from a state of fear to a state of excitement. You've tricked your brain. I will say that the thought I used to use before I found that, um, that video from Mel Robbins is just the realization that Everyone in the audience wants you to succeed. If you can look out into the Zoom void or out into the conference room and presentation arena when we're back to that, hopefully soon, you'll know that your success will mean something good for people in the audience in the form of a new idea, a new piece of information, or maybe even a new relationship. So now we're gonna get into the nuts and bolts of presentation. I, uh, at a certain point in my life, built websites. I had two spirit guides. Jacob Nielsen, who was a curmudgeonly Sun Microsystems engineer who migrated into advocacy for user-centric design 
And then the second spirit guide was a pioneering website called webpagesthatsuck.com. Learn about good design by looking at bad design. Both of these guides impressed upon me the necessity of always considering usability and information delivery. So when you are creating a talker presentation, your number one consideration should be the audience and their collective and individual abilities to access, to access, understand, and take away the ideas that you're giving to them. So as you prepare yourself and your materials, make every decision in service to your end user. The first impression is you and the basics. What are you wearing? What's in the background? People in television will tell you that white is an absolute no-no because you want to minimize reflected light, especially now that so many of us are on camera. Create a background that's visually interesting but not distracting. Any of you who are on Twitter, there's um, a user called roomraider.com that basically captures what's in the background of everybody who ends up on, can, on um, TV as a, as a pundit in the various political discussions that have been going on. It's really quite um, interesting. They always tell you, have a plant, they like books, maybe some artwork, which I didn't do today. Um, so also about your persona, keep your makeup matte so it's non-reflective, make it complement your features. Be mindful of um, things that are distracting, loud clothing, too much bling, a lot of makeup, unless that's part of your persona and job. Now, ahead of this, you wanna warm up your body. You're standing here in a room, talking at a camera for 30, 40, 50 minutes, an hour, like, Loosen up those necks and that neck and shoulders, move your jaw around, massage areas of your face. These are gonna be important to, to maintaining the strength of your voice and the delivery of your material. Number three is what I call the Ronald Reagan. As a graduate student, I one day walked into my thesis advisor's office to have our weekly conference over what I was working on at that point. And I opened the door, he had been watching TV. He turns around, he looks at me with the expression of someone who has just discovered a new dwarf planet somewhere in the universe. And he says, Ronald Reagan never touches himself above the shoulders. And I looked at him and I nodded. I sat down, we had the meeting. But that was one of those statements from, you know, you get statements from your elders and, and you, you hold on to those because you think there's gotta be some wisdom in there somewhere. And as I started to think about touching myself above the shoulders or not, when I spoke, I started to watch people. And I realized that, yeah, it's, it, actually can be quite distracting. And I'm sure that there's a poker player out there with a blog who will explain to you how every touch to the face is some kind of tell. Um, I will say that I, I do think people, when they get anxious, will start to touch around their mouth. And if you catch yourself doing that as you're having a conversation or as you're delivering your talk, just pause, check in with yourself, see if you've got some anxiety coming up, and then go back to five, four, three, two, one, anchor point, and see if you can't um, dissipate that. Now, if you're on Zoom, where should your eyes go? Um, it's hard to do for 30, 40, 50 minutes, but you just want to be looking right at the camera and you take your cue from every MSNBC pundit, you know that even if they're not talking, they are laser focused. So you want to be, um, you want to be that MSNBC pundit as much as you can be. 
on if you once we get back into live presentations, which we all hope we will, you want to start off staring to the back of the room because that's going to help your voice project to the back of the room. And then scan slowly from side to side, find friendly faces if you can. If you can't, just kind of find, find the interstices between people and place your eyes there. You want to give the audience a sense that you're with them, that you're talking to them. Create that connection and you can create that connection with your eyes. Now we're going to get to voice. How you say something can influence the way people hear you even more than what you say. We're while we all spend the bulk of our time preparing our talk or presentation, looking at the materials, making sure that those are all great, we spend almost zero time preparing the primary tool for delivering our talk, which is our voice. So power, modulation, cadence. Um, I will say that uh, US speakers will often deflate in the middle of the sentence. So they begin with strength and then they start to wither on the backfield. This has everything to do with breath. And so if you are not accustomed to belly breathing, find yourself a video or a tutorial to help yourself do that. You don't wanna be coming, trying to speak out of here, out of the upper parts of your chest. It's exhausting and it won't give you the power to sustain your voice through to the end of the sentence. Um, one way to prepare your voice is certainly to do warm-up exercises. Um, last night, I found one of the most terrific voice coaches I've ever seen, highly recommend her, Vanessa Van Edwards, and her website is scienceofpeople.com. She also has a YouTube channel, but you'll find a lot of her videos on Science of People. She has a terrific one for, um, for vocal warm-up, and, and that will do things like loosen up the front of your mouth, loosen up the palate, loosen up the tongue, all the things you, knew, you need to do to be able to speak smoothly and clearly for a long stretch of time. Another thing that can be really helpful are what we use, what we grew up knowing as tongue twisters, but um, Google knows as articulator simulators. Now, if you search for articulator simulators, look for articulator simulators for actors. Otherwise, you're going to end up on sites providing occupational therapy for children to help them speak more clearly. So articulator simulators are things like rubber baby, oh, I don't want to do this, rubber baby buggy bumpers. That was pretty good. Sea shells, sea shells, sea shells, but you, you know that one, right? These are all really terrific for, for preparing your mouth to move around certain clusters of consonants. And then um, vocal fry. So, Getting back to using our breath, when you hear vocal fry, and that's when somebody's like starts to lose breath in the middle of the, I don't know if I can do this, starts to lose breath in the middle of the sentence, and the voice starts to crackle around the edges, like that just means there's not enough breath in your vocal cords. It can be annoying to listen to. It can signal some anxiety or low confidence to your listener. So that's why you really want to work to build your breath and be able to carry the strength of your breath through to the end of the sentence. Um, it always tends to happen at the end of the sentence. So you either want to uh, breathe or just shorten your sentences. Um, again, Vanessa Van Edwards has a terrific little piece on vocal fry that I highly recommend if this is something you think might be um, plaguing the way you speak. Up talk, we all know, and, and that's make statements, not questions. So up talk is when you flick up the last, um, the last couple of your words so that you get kind of a, a question tone. Um, and you can end up confusing the listener with this you also diminish the impact of your sentence. Now, I know that there are certain social and cultural situations where softening the impact of your sentence is actually desirable, 
And so an uptalk inflection would be totally appropriate there. But try and if it's something that you are habituated to doing, try to um, try to listen for it and try to start to work that out of your speech patterns. The other piece is obviously filler words. Instead of filler words, silence can be your friend. Um, filler words are so, you know, starting your sentences with so, throwing in yeah, like, well. Um, um, I've also tried to stop using certain adverbs because I feel like those are kind of wasted words that don't necessarily help the impact of what I'm trying to say. And so if you find yourself using those adverbs and qualifiers, just consider what you're trying to do with that and at least make them intentional. So if you are trying to soften the message, to, again, totally appropriate, like up talk. But then again, when you are trying to make a strong message, do everything you can to eradicate those filler words. Again, there are some really high quality production videos on speaking and vocal warm-ups, um, especially those uh, people who are trying to school actors. Those are incredibly useful for helping yourself prepare for delivering your paper. Despite the many blog posts that are urging preventer, presenters that less is more when it comes to the presentation slides, I'm still flummoxed by how much people can cram onto a slide. So I'm a PowerPoint minimalist. And also, don't forget, I had Jacob Nielsen and web pages that suck as my spirit animals. So unless it's a chart, I rarely use an image beyond organizational branding. Um, in part because my material doesn't necessarily lend itself to visual representation, I'm also using the slides to reinforce the organization of my material and also help you to retain it. If I were just to be here talking, you might retain 10% of what I say. But if I have something on a slide that captures the general gist of my paragraph or my section of the talk, you'll retain up to 50%. It can also be a reference point to go back to if you're trying to remember aspects of this, this conversation. I also will say that trying to incorporate visuals into my slides just takes a lot more time and energy than I usually have time to do. So those are the choices I'm making. When I'm making slides, I'm reinforcing what I'm saying for you. And in doing that, I'm expediting your ability to read. So the tips I'm giving you now are out of basic website usability and legibility guidance. So what does your eye need on a slide, or, or frankly, in any document, to be able to read efficiently? High contrast, text to background, black on white, maybe a dark blue on an ivory if you really want to jazz it up a little bit. Um, next is a clear left margin. The left margin is your friend. Do not ever center large blocks of text, even if you're doing a marketing thingy. The, if you really want people to read it, their eye needs that margin. Another thing the eye needs to be able to move through uh, a bit of reading material is proper casing and punctuation. Did you know that if you write a sentence out in all caps, you will slow your user's reading speed to by, it's either 22% or 27%, but let's go with 25%. So proper casing are clues for your eye and your brain. And then also the punctuation really helps to, again, that, that those same control points that your eye and your brain needs to be able to assess what it's seeing. I tend towards three to five points per slide, fewer if I'm incorporating a chart. The other thing I do is I don't like bullets. I don't like having a big blob of dark ink starting off the sentence. It's too much of a pull for the eye. So I'm a big fan personally of the M dash. And you'll see that in my slides here. 
white space also, white space is your friend as well. So ensure that you've got nice spacing between each line of text. Lastly, we get to font faces. Now, the most readable tend to be Helvetica, Georgia, Verdana, and Garamond. I um, found myself curious about why Microsoft products all default to Calibri, and I didn't really find a clear answer, but I do find a lot of people in the font community who think it's a terrible font. So I do know, and for years, I have seen these four fonts listed as the most, in, the most pleasant to read and the easiest to read. So um, I will say on, back on presentation slides, uh, if you start to look into the big influencers who are doing a good job on presentation slides, the one name that comes up pretty frequently is Bill Gates. And I did actually look at one or two of his environmental presentations and he does do a great job of providing really, um, you know, truly lovely, impactful backgrounds to the text and the data that he shows on his slides. So if you really, if you want to do a more visual presentation, look at some of the influencers and see how they go around it. Um, it is definitely uh, a, an art and a science. So um, I'm going to stop there. I feel like I've delivered <laughs> a lot of information to you. I think there are probably going to be some questions. Um, again, we started out discussing the importance of the power of storytelling. Everybody in marketing knows the power of storytelling. I will um, hark back to a book I read a number of years ago called Made to Stick by uh, Chip and Dan Heath. And uh, some of their blog posts are still out there. And something that they impressed upon me was that uh, in uh, they, they were talking about Save the Children and how Save the Children shifted from showing everybody data on how much they were doing in the world and how terrible um, impacts on children were around the world. And they brought, down, uh, they brought down their campaign just to focus on single children in single countries. And those stories are really, really powerful. Um, and I hope that you take away and decide to start thinking about how you can incorporate some of your own personal history into the presentations you make to present your work. Um, second, we talked about anxiety, gave you a tactic for trying to transform any worry or anxiety you have into excitement about something that would otherwise be causing you some misery. And then third, um, the voice, I think that probably doesn't get talked about enough in public speaking about how we can um, work with, strengthen our voice to be able to, um, to bring the impact that our presentations deserve. So with that, I'll close and I would love to take any questions anyone has. Um, so we have one question in our um, question and answer box. Um, from Ed. He's asking, um, do you recommend the use of virtual backgrounds for video conferencing presentations? Oh gosh, you know, Ed, I, um, I don't love Zoom. Um, and again, when I see the virtual background, some of them look pretty good, but I also see just sort of a lot of wavering. And as somebody who was an art minor in college, that just kind of bugs me. I also think that if you're using a virtual background, you kind of miss the opportunity to put some of you into the background, into, into your background. Um, I think where we're getting some really good feedback about Zoom is that these Zoom moments are letting each of us into each other's personal spaces in a way we couldn't be there before. Use that to your advantage. And uh, we have another question from David. Um, fantastic presentation, probably the best one I've seen in a very long time. Thank you. For Zoom presentations, what's your take on scripting and reading off everything you will say as a means to keep you from wandering off? And did you read anything off your presentation today? David, I'm so glad you had to ask that because yes, I wrote everything out. 
I minimized, I actually have this set up so that I, I have a giant desktop. I hauled my giant desktop up into this room because of the natural light. And um, I had the slides over here in the corner and then I just kind of kept subtly working the script up. I had memorized most of it, not memorized, I, I knew a lot of it. By the time I started this presentation, I had done about three or four read-throughs. And, and part, of the, part of the exercise of reading through your script is also that you can anticipate uh, where you might trip up on some of those consonant clusters or, or parts of your sentence. You can also tell when your sentence is too long and you'll start to notice vocal fry. And so that can really help you break up your sentence structure. I hope that helps. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble reading. What about if your camera is at an angle to your face? I see this a lot, but they always say look into the camera. What do you think? They, they do. And so I see that a lot too. And I see that on um, the, the Twitter account Room Raider will also, will also make suggestions to whoever is protect, um, to whoever is presenting and whoever they're commenting on saying, hey, could have raised your camera up a little bit. So I have my desktop up on two stack tables and a book so that it's at eye level. Yeah, do everything you can to make sure that camera is at eye level. It's really helpful. It, it gives a very different sense than when it's too high or too, or too high or too low. Great. Um, how do you handle questions that you don't know the answer to? I, um, my palms begin to sweat, I freeze, and I stutter. Um, but you can, you can also just say, gosh, what a great question. I, you know, I wish I had an answer to that. I, I'd love to get back to you on that. Uh, and, and the other, the, um, yeah, that, that's how I would handle that. How do you deal with a hostile audience with some people asking you questions just to make you look bad? That's, um, that's an interesting question and I have never faced that. I have been in situations, I have certainly been in board situations where people are hostile, not so much as a presenter. And so what I would say to that is to don't get caught in the words. If somebody's throwing a hostile question at you, read between the lines. Where do you think that hostility is coming from? You could also put it back on them and say, um, that, that's interesting, why, why are you asking me that? Where's, where's that coming from? Because that, you know, maybe it wasn't part of your presentation or you're kind of going off into a different territory and I'm curious about what's driving that for you. So I would say figure out some good lines so you can put it back into their lap because they need to answer for their feelings of hostility, frankly. Um, do you recommend the power pose? Oh gosh. Um, do I recommend the power pose? I've never done it. Um, I, when I'm preparing for something, I try to prepare my voice. I try to prepare my, um, you know, my soul. <laughs> I do a little meditation and some deep breathing. And um, that just helps me get, get through the situation and, and just having the confidence that I've been asked. I know I've been asked because people think I'm gonna do a good job. And so I, I take a lot of um, power out of that. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience on this topic. I'm curious to know preparation techniques for impromptu presentations at work, boardroom, or on the spot. Mm. Um, in a couple of the, a couple of the um, boot camps that I did around public speaking, one of the exercises was we were all in a room and the facilitator would hold up a word for whoever was on deck. And you would have 30 seconds to think of that. And then you'd have to come up with a two minute presentation on that word. Could be purple, could be sunflower, it could be slate roof. I mean, you, you just, you didn't know. Um, you can play around with that. Um, 
And I'm not, and I'm not, th there's a question I'm not sure how to answer. I've always had some facility in being able to BS. So um, I wish I could just package that and hand you a box, but I can't. Uh, do you have any insight into the effectiveness of animation in PowerPoint presentations? Again, um, you see what a minimalist I am. I have played around with moving the lines in and I just, I'd rather, I personally would rather spend my time creating the material, but I can see where that can be useful. Um, so I would say, so, so I would, um, I, I would negotiate that and say, you know what? Yeah, if it's minimal and if it, and, and, and if you're adhering to the other good legibility principles, then yes. Go ahead. You have my permission. Um, any tips for foreign born presenters? What has been your experience in listening to them? Have you thought? Yeah, I, I, was, thinking, was, I was thinking about that, as, particularly as I was writing the voice piece. Um, I have at certain times been fluent in other languages, just not now. And uh, I, um, did I ever have, I don't think I ever had to give a presentation. But I suppose if I had, I would look for the equivalent of the, um, the um, what are they called? The arti I can't even remember what they're called. The articulator simulators. So, so Google articulator simulators for actors. Uh, and I don't think that you're going to be able to, um, and I don't think you would want to take out all of sort of the idiosyncrasies of, because I think foreign born accents are charming, but if there are certain words that you're getting hung up on or certain consonants, these simulators can be really helpful for helping you to practice and get better at facing them. I hope that helps. Um, thanks for your presentation. Do you have any tips on giving elevator pitches where you won't necessarily have backup materials like slides? Yeah, that I, I would write one. And so the, the, how I opened this presentation was a, a long-ish elevator pitch. But I do think, um, and I was working with an entrepreneur the other day, and, and he has a really impactful business, but he's not telling a story. He's got the data. He's got the data all day long about engagement and who wants to use his content he needs a story. And so I would say, think of a story about um, how and why your startup idea is relevant and, um, and then go from there. But again, hit somebody with a really, uh, really attention-grabbing line right out of the box. It, it might sound weird, but you know what? You're pitching someone in an elevator, so you want that. Um, very helpful presentation. You mentioned that Bill Gates makes great slides. I don't imagine he actually sits down and creates them himself. himself. Do you, what do you think this, the staff is made up of who makes these slides? Yeah, I thought about that myself. And when I was reading that, it's like, <laughs> Bill Gates is making his own slides. But you know what? He, he obviously had a hand in the Microsoft product. So I'm going to hazard he's probably pretty good at PowerPoint. Um, and, and you're right. But more to the point, go and find his presentations and use those as a model for what you might do, right? Um, the point about Bill Gates' presentations is the visuals, the visual to, as I recall, the visual to text ratio is really high. And um, so look about how those visuals are reinforcing and underlining what's actually on the slide and then think about how that's going to translate to whatever you're doing. And what about hand gestures, as many as you can? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that because I hadn't thought about hand gestures until last night. Why did I think about it last night? Because Vanessa Van Edwards has a great video on hand gestures. Um, her business, as I came to understand it, is um, she does a lot of behavioral analysis on what makes people charismatic, attractive, and what makes us listen to them. And so I had, I wasn't gonna talk about hand gestures because frankly, I didn't 
I didn't really know anything. I do my hand gestures, maybe they're too many, maybe they're too few, but um, you will find the video on her YouTube channel on, and it's seven, seven ways to use hand gestures. And so I'll start you off that um, she claims that the most viewed TED Talks are by people who use the most hand gestures, but not just use hand gestures, use them intentionally. That's the difference. And she will show you how to use them intentionally. So definitely check that out. Um, do you think dressing just a little bit more casually makes people seem more authentic? Um, I don't know where to go with that. I, I do think we make judgments about people. I um, moved up here to Albany a couple of months ago. My kids are involved with homeless outreach. And so I, I volunteer with the van with in the van with them. And people will make judgments on whether or not to give to somebody who's homeless, who's sleeping rough, who has no access to services, and whether or not they're wearing newer sneakers or not. So I would say we're making judgments about that all the time. Uh, and I would say just look at the context, read the room, right? Because everybody's going to come at it differently. Um, I'm always conscious about looking somewhat professional, right? Shirt with collar, you know, a little bit of jewelry, um, a little bit of makeup. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say you're just gonna have to read the room on that one. But, but as my father, that said, uh, I'm getting a message from my father. My father used to say, um, what, how did he put it? Um, th there's never gonna be any disadvantage in being overdressed something like that. He had a fancier way of saying it, but you get what I mean. Um, and then um, before we get to our last question, I just want to answer two questions uh, about the Zoom meeting. Um, I'm seeing that you turn text into real time. So actually one of our attendees shared this with me prior to the meeting that there could be live um, transcription through Zoom. So you enable it in your Zoom settings. And then once you get into the meeting, you click on more Wait, let's see. You click on um, like this, this live transcript, it says CC in the icon, and you could turn that on during your meeting. And that's a feature um, Zoom gives you. Uh, we have the webinar feature. I think it's available for meetings too. So it's through Zoom. Uh, it's a great tool. So thank you for the attendee that brought that to my attention. Uh, and then we had someone ask about recording. So this is being recorded and a video will be created um, and sent to all attendees. Um, so let's do one more question for Jennifer. Um, often when we are asked a question during a presentation, we look away or look up to give us a minute to think, um, to reduce distraction while doing so. I saw you did that also when you answered questions here. Um, would that be considered like seen as being evasive uh, or hmm. is that okay? Like, Wait, so what was I doing? I was looking down before I answered the question. They said um, you looked up. It's, it's possible. Um, thanks for calling my attention to that because yeah, there, there's there's not a great feedback loop here on Zoom. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would say to the degree that you can, just keep just look. If you're in a live situation, look look at your um, questioner. Um, if there are other people in the room, because sometimes yes, that gaze can get super intense. So you know, look look at somebody else in the room if if that feels appropriate. Um, and then I think on Zoom, you know, just keep trying to look at the camera. It is, um, it's, it's tiring. So if I'm looking down, I'm probably feeling just a little tired of staring at that dot. All right, I'm just going to share the screen again with your contact info. Mm, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, um, we're out of time. So this concludes the webinar. Um, but yeah, thank you everyone for coming and thank you, Jennifer. Um, this was super helpful. Oh, let me go to the slide that I intended. And thank you, Sarah, for manning the slides. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> All right, so, so I'll, I'll take it from here, Sarah, then. So Please. by the way, great questions. Thanks for being a great audience. And thank you, Jennifer, for the great talk. My pleasure. Uh,
And, and by the way, I just changed the font to my closing talks from Calibri to uh, Georgia. <laughs> Much easier on the eye. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you for participating in this event. Um, my thanks go to uh, colleagues who made this event uh, possible. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Uh, Rob DeFazio, uh, Dean Jane Polizzi, Ms. Carmen Marmo Savinetti, and of course our replaceables that uh, are uh, joining me here, uh, Ms. Sarah McGough and Mr. Tom Leggio. Uh, please tune in for the next talk on March 25th, titled A Successful Career in Engineering Consulting and Design by Mike Lantier of H2M Architects Plus Engineers. Be well. Thank you.